All right, so this morning we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 together. Uh, and I want to encourage you guys, as we study this epistle specifically, I believe like it's one of the most upside-down epistles that we have in the New Testament because it really does get into spiritual depths that we don't read a whole lot of because there's a lot of explanation because there is life in Christ and there are things in this life that we go through. There's a lot of pain that we suffer in this life and I love 2 Corinthians because what it does, it brings those things to light. And it shows us exactly what God is up to, what he's wanting to do in light of a world that is hard at times, but also in a life and in a world that we have a very real enemy who is at war. Do you guys know there's a battle going on right now over the souls of every single man, woman, child upon the planet? That is a truth and a reality that most people don't live in. And the longer I walk with Christ, guys, the more I see that spiritual reality realm, that's more real than anything. Do you guys know that this life is very short? It's but a vapor. It's very temporal. And there are things that the Bible explains to us that helps us to see what's really going on. And that's one thing I really enjoy about 2 Corinthians. So this morning we're going to look at chapter 4. And as I said before, I think these are some of the neatest scriptures that we have in all of the New Testament. So we're going to look at verse 1 here. It says, Therefore, since we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. So I want to pause for a moment. And as you guys know, every time we read the word therefore in the scriptures, what do we need to do? We need to ask, why is it therefore? I mean, what's going on? What's the context? What has been said before this? In the first three chapters, we've seen a lot from the Apostle Paul just laying out truths about who God is in the precious gospel that we've been entrusted with. And as a result of believing the gospel, we are the fragrance of Christ wherever we go no matter what we're going through in this life. And there's this ministry, this ministry of reconciliation, which we're going to get to in chapter 5. But Paul's speaking here, and he's defending his ministry, because some people were coming against the Apostle Paul. And we addressed a little bit of that in the last couple studies. But again, the Apostle Paul was called by God to take the gospel to who? To the Gentile world. And he took that calling serious. Because he did missions. That's all he did with the rest of his life. We're going to go for it. Everywhere we go, we're going to go and we're going to share Jesus Christ with all. And it's through mercy that he's received that. And the thing that I love here, did you guys catch that he says we do not lose heart? Okay? And that's one thing I want to really encourage you guys um, in the ministries God has called you to. Don't lose heart. And that's the thing that's cool when you're called by the Lord. Because it's a calling, and it doesn't matter what happens in life, how the ministry shakes out. Because if you're called, that's just what you do. I think about some who, like say in a formal ministry, like being a pastor, okay? You're called to do that type of ministry. Now, this can apply to any ministry that we're called to in life. But if you're called to something, how do you ever retire from that? Does that make sense? If God's called you and you have a purpose and he has a plan, how do you say, hey, I'm done with this calling you've placed upon my life. I am no longer going to preach the word or share the gospel or serve the poor or love my neighbor. Whatever God's calling you to, how do you retire from that? It doesn't make sense. But I think part of the reason is we have this off mentality as Christians because we're looking at ministry as a job. People retire from jobs all the time, right? But what are we called to and what's the purpose in our life? Job might be a part of that calling, but in that, what are we called to? What's the purpose God's given to us and how do we fulfill that ministry? So Paul here is speaking to this Since we have this ministry, okay, this gospel of grace, that we received mercy, we don't lose heart. And again, guys, if God's doing the calling, be encouraged this morning. 
This is what God has called you to. You don't lose heart. Because how many people have walked away? How many people have allowed Satan to get the best of them that they got derailed from their ministry? I know people today, clear as day, God called them. Called them. And they said, no, that's too hard. I want to do this instead. I want this career. I want to do this first. Then I'll do what God's asking me to do. Well, you know what? That never ended up happening. Guys, the only thing that matters in this life is that we make our election and calling sure. What is God calling us to? And are we being faithful? And we need to be faithful even when it gets hard, just as Paul says here, I don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. But he says in verse two, we've renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in the craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So in here, in verse 2, he's saying, hey, people twist the scriptures. We're not doing that to God's word. We have been faithful and we're speaking God's word in truth. Now, aren't you guys glad people don't twist the word of God today? Woo! Watch a few sermons online sometime. I'm just like, what is going on? And the thing is, first of all, the preaching of God's word. If any of us are in a place where we are going to share and proclaim God's word to another, we need to understand the scriptures speak that person's going to receive a stricter judgment. That's what the book of James says, because God takes his word very seriously. And we're told in the last days, 2 Peter 2, that there's going to be false teachers, Timothy tells us that in the last days, we're going to heap up teachers for ourselves. Why? Because we have itchy ears. Who's willing to twist God's word to make it fit my life? Now, that's a deductive approach to the scriptures. Now, the word of God, and some of you have been around long enough, you know that it's plain, that God is straightforward. He's not trying to confuse anybody. We can believe what God has said. We can take his word literally unless he tells us otherwise in the scriptures, we can believe every single word. Now, Paul is telling us here that there are those who have this shame because they're walking their own craftiness and they're not handling the word of God correctly, but they're doing it deceitfully. And a lot of times for gain. Because a lot of those sermons that you're going to hear if you're listening to, they're taking the word of God and they're proclaiming the scriptures for self-serving purposes. Send me your money <laughs> and then you'll be rich. Where is that in the scriptures, guys? But that's a lot of what we're hearing, at least from the Western world and from the pulpits in the Western church. That's not biblical. That's... Uh, exegesis, okay? Um, We're to take God's word for what it says and we take our lives and we fit it into what God says. Does that make sense? God, you say this, this is how I'm to live. This is what I'm to do, okay? But a lot of people approach the scriptures deductively. I want this and I want to find some scriptures to fit what I want. And in doing so, they'll go and cherry pick this one and that one, and they end up twisting the word of God. That's a deductive approach. And that's why we here at Freedom like to inductively study the scriptures. Very simple, very plainly, just verse by verse. And it's very important when we do that, we're understanding the context. Because a lot of times when scriptures are twisted, and you guys know that you guys really can make the word of God say anything, It's scary, but context is the safety to that. And that's why I love that we're working through the books because we understand the context in which God has been speaking. Even this morning as we get into a few of these verses, we have the previous chapters that bring some clarity to what he's speaking to that will protect us from bad theology, okay? To lies, really, because what you're doing when you're twisting the scriptures is you're allowing Satan (laughs) 
to lie. He's the father of lies. And we see that he is at work in the church today because the truth is not being proclaimed because we are deductively approaching the scriptures. So I want to encourage you guys, when you study the scriptures, and we're all called to do that, aren't we? Okay, I want you guys to be able to trust me, but I also want you guys to question everything I ever say. I want you to be in Acts 17, 11, to be a Berean. Go back to the scriptures. Receive the word with all readiness, but you need to be fair-minded. Go back and look at God's word. Is this actually what he is saying? Check out everything you ever hear from any preacher. Does this line up in the word? Because today we're looking, <laughs> a lot of Christians are looking for the new insight. Okay, this prophetic ministry over here, and if you listen to this guy, he's unpacking things that have never been heard before because he has special revelation. He's been able to interpret things in the scriptures that no one else has. That's a load of crap. The Bible says that the Bible is for no one's personal interpretation, Peter tells us. Do you guys understand that? And I'm always weary of someone like, hey, God revealed this to me, and I have this insight that nobody else has. Well, let me hear it, buddy. And they share. And it's like, well, that's wrong. God is reasonable. I love Isaiah's invitation in chapter 1. God says, come, let us reason together. He wants us to come and you know, study the scriptures. And we need to do that rightly. And I know I'm going off a little bit on this, but I want you guys to be those who take God's word seriously because he's asked us to do that. Okay, It's not just the pastor's job to study the scripture, show up on a Sunday and spoon feed everybody that comes. We're all to be in the word of God. We're all to be growing. And how do we do that? We inductively study the scriptures. We allow God to say what he says plainly, straightforwardly. This is what you declare, God. Now, what do I do with that? i got to take my life and fit it into what you say. And we're living in a day and an age where they're twisting Scripture. Don't you guys know that love is love? Homosexuality is okay. It's not, guys. It is still sin. Fornication, sleeping with a boyfriend or girlfriend before marriage, that is sin. Looking at a person lustfully, that is sin. You know, people can twist the scriptures to justify all of those things. We suppress the truth, don't we? Romans chapter 1. And we see that today. And we see people doing that with the scriptures. That's not actually what the Bible says. Well, if you deductively approach the scriptures, again, you can make it say anything you want. Question on us, are we humble enough to say, you know what, God, you're right. No matter my opinions... No matter my thoughts, no matter what that commentator says or that denomination says, what you say is what matters. And there's so much messy today in the church. We have extremes on doctrinal things today too, don't we? And some people say, hey, we got to find the middle ground on that. It's not middle ground. God is right. Do you guys get that? And in those extremes, there might be a couple things that this extreme group has right, but they're ignoring other things that God speaks about. And the same thing on this side. Hey, they might have some things that are right biblically, but they're ignoring other scriptures. And I want to tell you guys, if we ever have to ignore God's word, any part of scripture to come to some conclusion about what the Bible says and God has declared, you're wrong. You're wrong. All scripture is given by God. All of it. And it's all there for a purpose. And that's why we need to study to show ourselves approved to God. 2 Timothy 2.15. We need to study. So I want to encourage you guys. I don't want to be, you know, having any of us fall into a place where we are under these people who are crafty with the word of God, handling it deceitfully. Okay, we need to be honest and truthful with God's word. What he says is what he means. That's how simple of a guy I am. Sometimes I wonder if that's why God's called me to preach. You know, you're not too smart, son. You're just going to believe what I say. Okay, I'm going to believe it. You say it, 
We believe it. And that's how we roll here at Freedom Fellowship. This is what the scriptures declare. This is what we're going to do. But I don't feel that way. It doesn't matter how you feel. (laughs) Okay? You need to do what God says. And if you do what God says, your feelings are going to end up changing. Do you understand that? Because God is good. Because oftentimes when scripture gets twisted, do you know why? It's for sin's purposes. And you guys know that sin only brings destruction. It brings hurt. Why would anybody want to continue in that? There's a beauty and humility of just saying, you know what, God? You're right. You love me. You care about me. This is what you have asked. I'm going to do this. You have told me to treasure you above all things. I need to do that. And if I do that, you know what? It's going to spare me from idolatry. It's going to spare me from self. It's going to spare me from destruction and hurt. Your ways are good. So, enough said about that. Most of you guys have been around freedom long enough. You know that we like the word of God, and this is the reason why. He cares about us, and he is right. So don't let anyone deceive you. Okay, A lot of people are mishandling the word of God. And we're told that in the last days it's going to happen more and more. So we shouldn't be surprised that everywhere we look, it's just like, what are they doing? (laughs) God said this would be happening in the last days. Also, we look at verse 3. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Now, as remember last week, we talked about the veil that Moses had, right? Mo had a glow. You guys remember? Okay, we looked at that in Exodus 34. But that glow began to go. So that's why they covered him. It wasn't that he was still glowing. The glory was fading, okay? Because there was a greater glory in Christ. That's the only glory that's going to remain, But that began to fade. Now, what I love what Paul is doing here, this isn't a mixed metaphor. He's not recalling. This is actually a moving metaphor for you and I. He's building off where he's been. And that's why this context is beautiful. People wanting to live by the law. You can't do that. The law is there for one purpose, and that is to point us to Jesus. It is all about the gospel. It's to show us that we can't do it, and we need a Savior And that Savior is Jesus. So when verse 3 here, it says, but if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. It's those who can't see. They are literally blind. Their eyes have been covered. I think I mentioned last time just how beautiful the scriptures are and even the Old Testament. Do you guys know that there are a plethora, uh, 310 verses just concerning Christ's first coming? In the Old, Te- the Jewish scriptures, <laughs> Old Testament, and Jesus fulfilled every single one precisely, and yet they can't see that they that Jesus is their Messiah. They are blind. They are veiled. What is going on? Why is that? Well, there's a spiritual thing going on, and that's where verse four makes it very clear for you and I. And this is where I want to spend the rest of our time, just kind of camping on these few verses together. Now, I want you guys to pay attention up on the screen because I'm going to highlight a few things that I think is going to help us, okay? Because it talks about this veil, who the minds, so our minds, the God of this age. Now, who's the God of this age? It is Satan, okay? Well, how do we know that? Okay, you guys need to step back. Again, this is why it's good that we know the scriptures and we've studied to show ourselves approved because a lot of people will say, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> I thought all the earths and all that it contains belong to the Lord. Now you're saying that the God of this age is Satan and that it actually belongs to him? What's going on? Well, didn't Jesus even say that Satan was the God of this world? He did. Do you guys remember when Jesus early in his ministry was driven into the wilderness for 40 days? Do you guys remember that Satan came to tempt him? And one of those temptations was what? Hey, I, Satan, have all the kingdoms of this world. And all the glory of these kingdoms, they belong to me. And Jesus, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all these kingdoms in all the glory of these kingdoms. I will give it to you. Did Jesus dispute him and say, Satan, you're actually not right? He didn't dispute him at all. Well, what's going on there? Do you guys know 
<laughs> big picture of why Jesus came. He came to redeem the world back. Because the world was entrusted by God to who? To us. Adam and Eve, this is all yours. You're to take care of it. And they forfeited it to Satan. Because Satan came and did what? Twisted the word of God. Crafty little bugger, huh? Okay? And a lot of times when we see preachers who are crafty, you got to look at for what they are. Okay? They're a tool of the enemies. That's all that's going on. And we need to know the truth. God said this. But wait, 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 wait a minute. Has he really said? No. What God says is what he means, guys. Very black and white. And we're told in the scriptures that man forfeit that title deed of the earth. It was given over to Satan. And yeah, he is the God of this age. And a lot of people don't like thinking about this. But again, do we want to get what the Bible teaches? I do. I want to get it right so I can live rightly. And in understanding that, it makes a whole lot of sense of why the world is the way it is. Because God is right. You guys see all the chaos, war, evil in the world today? Does that kind of make sense if Satan's the God of this age? It does. And one of the hardest things people have a hard time hearing or swallowing is that most of the people upon this planet are children of Satan. They don't like hearing that. But aren't we all God's children? Do you guys know that's horrible theology? Horrible theology. You are a child of Satan's until you put your faith in Christ. Because then you are set free. Why? Because Jesus did come according to the scriptures. And you know what he did by shedding his blood? The righteous for the unrighteous? A debt was paid. Redemption took place. You guys understand that he redeemed earth, this world. That's what Christ did when he came. And you guys know that he's coming back? He's got the title deed. If you guys don't believe me, check out Revelation chapter 4 and 5. It explains very clearly what's going to happen when Christ returns. Okay? He has the right to take it all back to himself. And all of heaven is going to glorify and praise him because he is the one who has the right to that deed to redeem all things back to himself. And that's the cool thing because when Jesus comes back, guess what? Satan's thrown in the pit and he's going to rule and reign, and righteousness is going to once again abound upon the planet. And that's why we're told to pray for the Lord to come. Well, pastor, where does it say that we're to pray for the return of Jesus? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy what? Kingdom come. That's how Jesus taught us to pray, right? Let the kingdom come. Aren't we praying that all the time? I pray Maranatha all the time. Come, Lord Jesus. We need him to come and to redeem. So, back to this, guys. We see the God of this age, okay? He is the one that has blinded people. Think about that. There's a spiritual truth. Satan is blinding people. This is a spiritual reality going on. And who's he blinding? Those who do not believe what? Is that really true? How many of you guys share your faith with others? Ever speak to a non-believer that's just completely unreasonable? They can be reasonable about everything else. You can have a civil conversation with them why the Packers aren't so good this year. Yeah, I agree. This is what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about anything with them. But the second you start talking about Jesus, they blow a lid. You guys know what I'm talking about? Why? Because they are blinded. You can be reasonable. We can make sense of things in this life. But when it comes to truth about who God is, about the gospel, about Jesus, you are the most unreasonable person in the world. And I think about how many people out there today have bought into how many different lies just to excuse away the truth of who God is. They can be so reasonable in things in life But when it comes to this, Satan has blinded them. They have a veil. They cannot see. So we need to understand what's going on when it comes to the souls of every man, woman, and child. 
Okay? And what do we do? We pray, don't we? We pray. Last night at dinner, my son, oldest son Uriah, has a friend on the other side of the world. Well, how is that possible? There's this internet thing. They play games together. He's sparked up this, well, his friend is an atheist. Well, what should we do? Pray. We need to start praying for him. And that's what we're going to do as a family. We're going to pray. Why? Because we believe what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The God of this age has blinded him. And for anybody to say that there is no God, that's a blindness. How can you look at creation and say there's no creator? That's hard to do. The Bible says only a fool says that. Well, why are they so foolish? Because they're blind. How can a person look at the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the greatest news of all time, and say, hey, I want nothing to do with a God who loves me, who's created me to have fellowship with him, who wants me to be in heaven with him forever and ever and ever? What kind of stupid (laughs) does there have to be for someone to say, I don't want that? I would rather live in my sin to live in bondage. You guys understand, this is bondage. I've had atheists tell me, why are you a Christian? You have to do all these things. You don't have the freedom to enjoy life. I'm like, I got all the freedom I want in life. Christ has set me free. You're the one in bondage. Do you have to drink? Are you free from being done and being an alcoholic? They can't stop. They're not free in Christ. Christ sets us free. It's for freedom's sake. Didn't we read that last week in chapter 3? Again, guys, context is so important. We're free. So those who don't believe, they're in bondage, okay? At least what? (laughs) The light of the gospel, okay? Things are dark out there. (laughs) How are people going to see? Well, they need a light. And I'm I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1.16. People need to hear the good news. How are they going to hear unless there's a preacher? God has asked us to go into the world and preach the gospel, guys. We need to be doing that. How are they going to know any differently? We need to share. Just in the last couple of weeks, I spoke to an elderly lady who actually went to church. Got to share the gospel with her. Just like I've never heard this before. And you've been going to church. What you've been hearing at church? The church may have been preaching the gospel. I'm not sure. But for her not to see the gospel, I know Satan was at work there, keeping her blind from Jesus. And Satan's good. He'll have us go and do a lot of different things in the dark. Kind of like legalism. Look at how good I am. How many people in the world today think they're going to heaven because they're a good person when God has said plainly in the word there are none good? No, not one. And all you non-good people, which is all of you, need to repent and put your faith in Jesus. Pretty simple, but the world doesn't like that. Even though it's the best thing anybody can do. So, the light of the gospel is of what? It's of the glory of of Christ. And this is where this gets beautiful, guys. We're told there's this glory of Christ who is the image of God. Didn't Jesus say, hey, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen who? God the Father. Right? Show us the Father. Jesus is God. Do you guys understand that? He's the express image. We read upstairs before prayer, Hebrews chapter 1. Read that later, guys, if you weren't there speaks all. Let's consider Jesus, who he is. He's the express image of God. Okay, He's equal with God because he is God. He's the image of God. Okay, A couple of you guys came to the old folks home with me on Tuesday and we just looked at a few verses. We've been working through the Gospel of John with this group of elderly people. And there in the middle of chapter 5, just a few verses we looked at together, there are six claims Jesus made there about being God and how he has been given judgment of all things. And he just lays out very clearly 
that he is the creator of all things. And yet, the world doesn't know what to do with Jesus. Because the world says, well, yeah, he was a good dude, taught us some good things, good teacher, right? But he's not God. What does it tell us here? Well, the God of this age, Satan, has blinded people that they won't believe, but the light of the gospel declares to us what? The glory of Christ, who is the image of God, okay? That it should shine on them. And I love this idea of light here, okay? This light, what is it going to do? It's going to shine on them. And that's what happens when a person looks to Christ. They are able to see. Look into him. It's not any of, <laughs> anything of this life, okay? It's not in religion. It's in God himself. It's when you look to him, the light of the gospel, this good news, shine on them. And then verse 5 says, For we don't preach ourselves, Paul says, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded the light. Here we see light again. So God's commanding light to shine out of darkness who is shown in our hearts. And this is important because our minds and hearts here, guys, he'll show in our hearts to give the light of the gospel or the knowledge of the glory of God again in the face of Jesus Christ. So it's one of those things when the gospel is proclaimed, people's eyes are going to be opened to the truth. And that's the thing that is so cool to think about because there are those today who don't believe who've been blinded by Satan. What's going to overcome that? It's the light of the gospel. It's pointing people to Jesus. And I want to flip this just for a second. How many of you believe that we still can be blinded by Satan at times, even as believers? Okay, we need to be careful. But when does that happen? It happens when we get our eyes off of Jesus. Okay, we need to continue to abide in the truth of the gospel. Our eyes fixed upon Jesus. Okay, otherwise we're going to be looking at the things of this life, our circumstances, lies Satan. You know he's constantly throwing lies at us, even as believers, right? And that's why we're to take up the whole armor of God. We got to be protected. Got to keep our eyes on Jesus. And here's the key. If you don't get anything else this morning, get this. Are we seeing how beautiful the gospel is here? Okay? It is this light that breaks through the darkness who can set us free. The glory of God, this light of the knowledge of the glory of God, it's in the face of Jesus. As we look to Jesus, and if we're treasuring him rightly, if we treasure Christ above all things, that's when the foolishness of unbelief is going to stop. And that's the problem I believe today with so many is they don't rightly divide the word and understand that it is all Jesus. It is all about him. It is all about his glory. And we fall into a place where we can be lied to that we'll find ourselves being blinded because we're not rightly treasuring Christ. And I believe that's why people don't come to salvation. Because they want to treasure something lesser. I matter more than God. My sin, that may be fun for a season, matters more than God. Focus on the family. My children matter more than God. My spouse matters more than God. Satan will even twist good things in our life to get our eyes off of Jesus and treasuring him rightly. And my prayer is, guys, is that we treasure him above all things. All things. And that's what's going to keep us. Again, we don't lose heart. I believe we can do that when we're treasuring Christ rightly. And I don't want any of us to lose heart. We need to be treasuring him above all things. And when we're doing that, we're not going to lose heart. We're going to keep going because ministry is not easy. 
Paul was going through it. People were after him. It was hard, but he's able to keep going. Now, I want to conclude with this thought here. Look at verse 5 again with me. Paul's saying, you know, we do not preach ourselves. Okay, it's not about our greatness. It's about Jesus. You guys know that what ministry is? Just point to Jesus. If they're looking at you, <laughs> point them to Jesus. That's what we do. It's not look at how great I am, look what I can do. No, look at Jesus. Okay? And if there is any good that you see here, it's because of him. It's his grace in me. I am what I am by the grace of God. Look to Jesus. So we don't look to ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord in ourselves, your bond servants for Jesus' sake. Okay? And that's how I would ask you guys to pray for your pastors. Pray for us. Pray for Lance. Pray for me. Pray for other pastors you know. That it wouldn't be about us. That it's all about Jesus. Because let me tell you what. Those are the type of guys I like to be ministered to by. Who's over themselves? It's not about them. It's about Jesus. And that's what I love about Paul. Follow me. As he does what? Follows Christ. Don't you want that to be said of each of you? You know, I do want to be walking with Jesus in such a way that I can say, hey, come along. That's discipleship, guys. Let's do life together. I'm loving Jesus. Come with me. I'm looking to him. Look at him with me. That's how simple it is. So let's be praying. Satan's blinding people today. And you can look at how foolish the blindness is. We teach our kids there's no God. That's one of the most foolish things I've ever heard. How can you say there's no God? But that's what we teach our children. It's sick. It's twisted. Satan's taught a bunch of young people in the Middle East that Israel's the little Satan. No, Israel's a sinful people that need a Savior, and their Savior is Jesus. Just like every single Muslim upon the planet, they are all sinners in need of a Savior. And Jesus, I don't know if you guys know this or not, he died for the Muslim too. We need to be praying because the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. And what can we do? It's a spiritual battle. There's a blindness going on. That's why we need to be praying and praying and praying. Okay, I've had people in my life where I've shared the gospel with and their heart is so hard and they're so blind. They want nothing to do. And there's been times where I felt the Spirit say, pause, <laughs> you're done preaching to them. Get on your knees and start praying for them. This is a spiritual thing. And sure enough, there was some breakthrough. And oftentimes it wasn't me who got to lead them to Christ. It was someone else or something God was doing in their life. So let's be praying. Sound good? Does this passage make sense? Do you guys see why this is really important for you and I to get? Okay, there's a context here. Satan's up to a lot. He knows his hour is getting close. <laughs> He's trying to take down as many as he can. So let's be praying. Let's make him the priority. Let's encourage one another to keep looking onto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And let's treasure Christ rightly. I believe that's the key here and that we won't get duped by our enemy if we're looking to Jesus. Amen? So Father, we are thankful for your word here this morning. I think it's so cool that you were the one that commanded light to shine out of darkness. You've shown into our hearts the truth of who you are to know you, Jesus. I mean, that's what life is all about. That's eternal life, to know the one true living God in Jesus Christ whom we've sent. God, and it's not just a, a mental thing. It's a heart thing. And I'm so thankful. We're thankful for how you shed abroad in our hearts your love that we know the gospel is truth. And that's why we want to share this good news with everyone but we know that there's a very real enemy out there. He's blinding people today. And we do want to pray for our loved ones. I know we all probably have family that's still walking on belief. There's people right here in our city, in our community, throughout this valley, or all over this world that are just completely blind and they don't even know it. 
God, we know that you're in the business of saving people. That's what you do. We pray that you would be opening hearts and minds to the truth of the gospel, that you'd open doors wide and that we would be bold with sharing that good news with others. And I do want to pray specifically if there are areas in our own lives that Satan, you know, has been lying to us about, God, that we're blind to, open our eyes, please. Help us to discern those things and to walk in truth. Thank you so much, Jesus, for all that you have done, all that you're wanting to do. I pray that we would be a believing people, that we would be in the light as you are in the light. I'm praying your name. Amen? Amen.